In this video, you're going to deploy a real web application to AWS using Elastic Beanstalk. Before we complete this project, make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay current on all of my cloud content, and let's dive right into it. The first thing we need to do is download the project files. I left you a link to this GitHub repository inside of your video description. It contains the web application that we're going to deploy to AWS using Elastic Beanstalk. So make sure to clone the repo inside a directory of your choice. Doesn't really matter. I'm going to clone it in a folder I called YouTube tutorial. And let's go ahead and commence this lesson. We're going to be doing everything from the cloud console. So make sure that you're signed in as some user who has the permissions needed to use Elastic Beanstalk. If you don't have that basic setup, it is a prerequisite. So what you would want to do is go on YouTube, look up AWS setup, look for my video, and it's going to get you up and running. If you can't find this video, write AWS setup Rian Slim, and it should pop up. Anyways, assuming that you're signed in, go ahead and look for the Elastic Beanstalk service, because this will allow you to very easily run and manage your web apps. Go ahead and say, create application. Easily deploy your web app in minutes. Okay, first and foremost, the environment that we're going to choose to run our application is a web server environment. This can be used to run a website, web app, or web API. The application whose code we're going to upload in just a second, we're going to call it Visitor Counter App. The environment that will house this application, its name gets autofilled based on the application name. Simple enough. The domain, we're going to let this auto-generate. Auto uh, this just becomes part of the application's URL. All right, simple enough. The platform that we're going to be choosing to run our application is Node.js. We can now upload our code. How simple was that? We're going to upload our code using a local file that we have on our local machine and upload the zip file that contains the source code and dependencies at the root. Okay, go ahead and upload it. For presets, we're going to use a single instance free tier. What this basically means is Beanstalk will deploy a single EC2 instance, a single physical cloud server that is going to run the environment for our web app. It's pretty cool how we can just press a button instead of having to spin up that EC2 instance ourselves, configuring firewall rules, etc. We can just press next and be done with it. But I lied. The application that you deploy, you need to give it a version label so that when you deploy future versions, you can tell the difference between them. We're just going to call the first version of our app deployment v1. Now we're ready to deploy our web app and its environment in a single EC2 instance. Pretty cool how we can just do that. Now we configure service access. This part is crucial to ensure that your deployment goes by smoothly. We start with the service role. By service, we mean Elastic Beanstalk. And right now, we need to give it the role, the permissions that it needs in order to create and manage AWS resources for you. It doesn't have that role by default. You need to create it and assign it to it. So we'll create the role. The, create, the role we're creating will apply to entities of type AWS service because Elastic Beanstalk, like EC2, like Lambda, is an AWS service. Here we highlight the service for which we're going to assign the role. And here is the role we're assigning, Elastic Beanstalk Environment. This basically allows Elastic Beanstalk to access and control other AWS services in your account so that it has whatever it needs to build your environment. Now we click Next. Click Next. So this will be the role name, AWS Beanstalk Service Role allows access to other AWS services to create and manage environments. Pretty cool. All right, and if you go to your IM service, you can now see it within your list of roles. This role is what we're going to assign. Let me refresh our service in this case so that it can do what it needs to do. Now we move to EC2 instance profile. Remember that Beanstalk is going to create one EC2 instance, EC2 being the actual server, the actual compute that's going to be running your app. 
the app running in that server, let's say it needs to interact with an S3 bucket or it needs to interact with DynamoDB. These are AWS services and your app by default won't be able to access them unless we attach certain roles to the EC2 instance that that app is running in. So once again, we need to create a role for Elastic Beanstalk and we need to make sure that Elastic Beanstalk attaches that role to the actual compute, the actual EC2 instances that are gonna be running our app. So this basically allows our environment's EC2 instances to perform operations required for our app. That's really it. Click next. Click next. Everything looks great. Now we see that role within the I am service and we can assign this role. We won't need to create an EC2 key pair because we're not gonna need to SSH into our servers. If you wanna learn more about EC2 key pairs actually, it's something we did cover in the AWS setup tutorial, so feel free to go through that. But in this case, we don't need to SSH into our servers. Click next. Now we set up the networking. We're not gonna create a new VPC. Let's just use the default one that automatically gets created for whatever region you're operating in. For me, it's US East 1. Yours could be US West 2, EU West 1, doesn't really matter. Just deploy all your resources in a VPC. If you watched my previous video titled AWS VPC plus EC2 tutorial, you'll know that all a VPC is is a virtual boundary that isolates your resources into a private network, separating it from other resources in other networks. Simple as that. While a VPC can span an entire region, a VPC is composed of subnets, all right? Each subnet spans a single availability zone in that region. Availability zones making up the physical data centers where your EC2 instance will actually be. I'll choose to deploy everything in the availability zone US East 1C. Doesn't really matter. So one VPC, one virtual private network can span an entire region. There are many availability zones per region, many physical data centers. We're just gonna deploy everything in US East 1C. I'm gonna assign a public IP address to the Amazon EC2 instance so that we can publicly access the web application running in it, all right? Again, if you wanna learn more about VPCs and subnets in a way that isn't rushed, make sure to check out my AWS VPC and EC2 tutorial, but we didn't really do anything interesting. I don't understand why we have these errors here, but whatever, click next. Root volume type determines the type of storage that your EC2 instance will use to read and write data. For the type of storage, we can just use general purpose SSD because our Node.js app is just serving a static web page and counting visitors. We don't really need any crazy disk performance. General purpose SSD will do just fine. Now, if you're doing something really demanding, like running a high traffic database, then you would want to use provisioned IOPS SSD, but general purpose is like that sedan that will just get the job done 90% of the time, no matter what. The number of gigabytes this volume will have needs to be 10 at least. So we'll just do that. And I'm going to leave everything else the same. Architecture x86-64, that's fine. It doesn't really matter what architecture we choose in this case because AWS Beanstalk is gonna install all of your dependencies for you in-house. If you were installing your dependencies in your own local machine, then if these dependencies were to have some pre-compiled binary components in there, you'd have to ask yourself, well, what architecture were they compiled for, x86 or ARM? And then you would have to choose the right architecture. But in this case, Beanstalk is gonna be installing the dependencies for you, so it doesn't really matter. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and click next. For health reporting and monitoring, 
the defaults are fine and sensible for a learning environment. So I'm just going to go ahead and skip through these and press next. Now we simply review everything we've got. And we launch this baby, create. Our environment is starting. Let's give it some time. This is a few minutes in. Here you can see it's created some security groups. It's launching the EC2 instance. Should take some time. I'll come back in a second. All right, we were able to successfully launch our environment such that the underlying app is available at this public domain. We'll be accessing our application at this domain in just a second. And the application is running inside of the following EC2 instance. Beautiful. We see one simple warning that doesn't really matter. Basically, the Node.js version that we chose to run our app, the platform, is there's a mismatch between it and the Node.js version in package.json. This is 18, whereas the one we chose was 22, but doesn't really matter. Everything should be backwards compatible. We can ignore the warning. Uh, if you want to change it to 22, by all means, go ahead. I'm just going to proceed by navigating to our publicly deployed application. I did test it and press it nine times before resuming this recording, but feel free to refresh it as many times as you want. You'll see the counter increment, but you'll notice here it says served by instance unknown. Why? That's because the underlying app was programmed to expect an environment variable. The environment variable is instance ID. If it doesn't get one from AWS, it's just gonna default to unknown. I did this so that I can demo another feature, which is the ability to pass environment variables from AWS to your app. Let's do it right now. Let's go back to our AWS Cloud Console. Go back over here, go to environments. We're gonna to go to the visitor counter app environment that we created via Elastic Beanstalk, then go to configuration. All right, go to updates, monitoring, and logging. You're gonna edit that. And then the UI changes from time to time, but look for anywhere where you can add environment properties, environment variables in this case. We're gonna create an environment variable in plain text for the environment property key, the application we're running right now expects an environment variable called instance ID, and we're gonna give it a value of server one. All right, doesn't really matter. Click apply. And it took a while, but now Elastic Beanstalk is updating our environment. All right, and five minutes later, environment update successfully completed. After you press apply, Elastic Beanstalk will automatically update your configuration. We can see this from the logs over here. Environment update is starting, updates the environment, etc. until we get to here. So going back to our app, starts up again at one time because it was redeployed. Then we just keep refreshing, all is well. That's really all I wanted to teach you for application deployment. And that's really all I wanted to cover for this lesson. You now know how to deploy an application to AWS using Elastic Beanstalk and how to inject environment variables into that app. This would be very useful if your application relied on an environment variable to let's say connect to a database. If that environment variable provides it the connection URI. Anyway, now what I encourage you to do before we clean up, a step you should not skip, is to go through the AWS console and look at the resources it created for you. It created for you a virtual server on the cloud, an EC2 instance that is running your application. And now let's look at the firewall rules that Beanstalk configured. So security groups in this case. Security groups uh, are firewall rules that basically determine what traffic can go in and what traffic can go out. And those rules were already set up for you. So rules for inbound traffic were simply that requests can simply connect to the standard web port 80 of your EC2 instance, such that any IP address is able to connect to that server. 
Without this rule, nobody could access your website and the firewall would block all incoming traffic. So that was set up for you as well. You can also go back to Beanstalk, click on monitoring. You can monitor how much CPU your app is using, uh, network traffic going in and out, so on and so forth. That's really where I wanna finalize things. Now it's time to clean up. So all of the resources that were created inside of this environment, we can terminate by simply terminating the environment itself. So terminate the visitor counter app env that contains all of our EC2 instances, all of our firewall rules, etc. And then we're gonna be done with it. So I'm just gonna let this run for a few seconds and make sure that everything was deleted. Be back in a sec. All right, a few minutes later, the environment was terminated. You should see a blue check mark of sorts. Now what you wanna do is go to applications, terminate the application as well, or delete it, I should say. Visitor counter app. It's being deleted. Now if we go to like EC2 or something of that sort, you should see the EC2 instance is now gone, courtesy of removing our environment. Security groups belonging to that instance should be gone as well. Let's go ahead and check back on our application. That's done as well. That's where we're gonna wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And now before I let you go, I do actually want to promote my Docker course. So go to rianslim.com, choose the Docker course, and why the Docker course in this case? Well, what we just did with Elastic Beanstalk, we could have done the exact same thing using the Elastic Container Service and deployed our application much more reliably as a Docker container. A container would already include all the dependencies and the runtime that's needed to run your application. This ensures that your containerized app will run the same way reliably no matter which cloud provider you use with minimal configuration changes. In today's cloud native world, you need to understand containerization and my Docker course is the best resource to do that. So do make sure to sign up as you await more videos that I'm gonna release for my cloud series and I will see you in the next one.